I wouldn't say he was in very good shape, do you? But you can advance an individual well up above his ability to tolerate. There is what is known as a post-hypnotic suggestion. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to our whole new world. An understanding of this can assist an understanding of the basic mechanism of insanity. Whatever you have heard, if you haven't heard it from us, I can assure you, we are not what you expect. There's a lot of talk about us, and we get it. And that Scientology is not just something you believe in, it's something you do. He is not consciously aware of the command. If told he had been given an order while asleep, he would resist the idea or shrug, but he would not know. There remains the question of why so many people are Scientologists. At last, the subject may become aware from the expressions on people's faces that something is wrong. Jeff, I'd welcome to my channel. How are you doing today? I am very good, and thank you for having me, Kelly. It's uh, it's a pleasure. No, I am honored to have you here. I really wanted to have a chat with you because I've seen you've done some post-Scientology recovery work in your community, and I would love to talk to you a little bit more about what it really means to recover from Scientology. Before we kind of get into that, could you give us a little bit of background of your sort of time in Scientology, like what what job you did and things like that? Yeah, yeah. I was in Scientology for 35 years, most of that time in the Sea Org. I got in Scientology in Los Angeles in uh, at the end of 1967. Yeah, end of 67, beginning of 68, I got into Scientology. And then I joined staff at the Publications Org in, which was in Scotland at the time. We then moved to Copenhagen, Denmark, and I was there for about six years. And then I was actually called to the ship, the Apollo. Yeah, um, Hubbard was forming uh, a marketing unit and he issued an order. And I, it was in the orders of the day for the Apollo ship. And I was shown it and it said, you know, we're starting this marketing unit, get Hawkins from Pubs Denmark. Like he, he named me, you know, and I was like, ah, you know. <laughs> so that was uh, uh, an invitation that I wasn't going to refuse, you know. So I went to the ship and joined the marketing area uh, there, met Hubbard. And then we went to Clearwater from the ship. And, uh, and I was in Clearwater until about 1980. And then I went to LA on a mission. I had always wanted to run a big public campaign for Scientology. I mean, this was like what I really wanted to do. You know? So I, I petitioned uh, CMON to be able to do that. And uh, they okayed it. I said I would need about six months to do all the research and ramp it up because I had no idea what I was doing. So then I started researching, did a lot of um, work on demographics, the, which demographics we were going to target. What was the demographic? Well, it's very interesting because what I did, which was completely forbidden, was I took the Scientology mailing list and I had it on a, you know, like a floppy disk. And I gave it to a market research company, which is strictly uh, forbidden and off policy to, to send the mailing list anywhere. Yeah. But I gave it to this marketing research firm and they ran it through their computers. And then they came back with all kinds of uh, bar charts and pie charts and tables and everything showing the demographics of our existing public, of 
the Scientology existing public, which was um, mostly, I think it was mostly 24 to 34, 60% male, 40% female, college educated, was working with a media firm. And I said, this is my demographic. And, you know, this is the people that I want to reach. And so they worked out a media buy, which then over a period of a couple of years, we fine tuned that uh, because they they would do crazy stuff. They came to me one time and they said, um, they gave me a whole media buy and I was going down line by line and it said, Saturday morning cartoons. And I said, what, what, why is this here? And they say, well, that's going to reach your target demographic. And I said, I am not trying to reach people who watch Saturday morning cartoons. I don't care what the demographics say. That's not who I want. And so I went down through the programming in great detail and said, Twilight Zone, absolutely. Uh, something for you, sir. Sh shoelaces, maybe. Is that what I need? That's for you to say, sir. Uh, if not shoelaces, maybe some, some nice matches. I have several different now, designs. Now, come on. What do I need? You tell me, old lady. One needs many different things. Yeah, yeah, but what do I need now? Huh? What do I need tonight? It's late. What do I need? Classic movies, yes. Uh, any science fiction program, absolutely. Star Wars, yes, do all that. Because that was the kind of programming I liked, and that was the kind of programming that everybody I knew liked. And everybody I knew was, was Scientologists, really. I was flying by the seat of my pants, but it was fairly easy to spot where I should be um, going. We were making different kinds of ads, different kinds of TV ads. And... Um, you know, it was inter an interesting process, and we also had to figure out how to get books into bookstores because I had no idea how to approach that, and nobody else did, you know, in within Scientology. Nobody knew how to do this stuff. So I hired a, a fellow named Len Foreman who was used to be the vice president marketing for Simon & Schuster. He knew everybody in the business. He knew the, the, uh, all the buyers for the chain stores and all of the distributors. And he was on a first name basis with all these people. When he first went to the big chains, which at that time was uh, B. Dalton bookseller and Walden books. Uh, and they said, no, we don't want anything to do with Scientology. Those guys are nuts, you know? And he said, no, this is a different group and they're really serious about it. So they said, okay, well, we'll, We'll give it a try. And uh, so we were able to get the books in the bookstores, which is so important. I mean, if you're running TV ads and there's no books out there, you're just wasting money. You know? By the time we launched, and this was in October 84, when we launched the, the first TV ads, we had 250,000 books out in the stores. The minute we put those TV ads on the air, boom, the sales started to go. You must have been very popular then. You know, you must have got a high commendation for your, for your efforts, no? I was commended by Hubbard, but never by Miscavige. Uh, quite the opposite. He hated me. You were cleverer than him, I imagine. <laughs> you know, he hates anyone that's smarter than he is or who is more talented than he is. He absolutely hates that because he sees it as a power threat. Yeah. Uh, so he ends up hating pretty much everybody. I was a target. He couldn't wait to destroy the campaign. You know? yeah. I had about 11 staff and was working with a lot of outside firms. And my unit was just decimated on his direct orders. I do wonder, um, I wonder when you first, you know, you've got this commendation by L. Ron Hubbard, but you're meeting him, you're a young man. Like, I always wonder how he managed to get people on his side, right? I, I don't know him when he was alive. I only hear stories about him. And there seems to be a theme of this, like, charm and charisma that, that people seem to say for, that he had. So when, when he gave you this commendation, what did you, how did you feel? Oh, I, I was over the moon, you know, because I always respected him. Uh, I had met him on the ship 
he's an impressive guy. You know, he was very charismatic, very big, he's over six feet. He was like, if you took, if you took a normal person and just inflated them about 150%, that was Hubbard. He was just big in every way. He had a big head, big body, and he was tall. He was over six feet. And uh, he was the kind of guy that, whether you were a Scientologist or not, if he walked into the room, all the attention would go on to him. He was just that, um, I don't know, present. He had a, a great sense of humor, and he was a storyteller. He could charm anybody, you know? Back in those days, I considered him to be an ally because um, after I had launched the campaign, people were, they were saying, well, why aren't there any people in the orcs? And this is a waste of money and blah, blah, blah. And Hubbard wrote down and he says, you have a winning horse here that is not being fed enough oats. Boy, I, I was glad to hear that because he said he was backing me 100%. And I had some allies um, at ASI, Author Services, that were really giving me a lot of air cover. People kept trying to remove me from posts and stop my campaign. And all I had to do was phone over to ASI. Fran Harris was at ASI then, and she's always been a great friend of mine. And uh, she would just quash any effort to, to mess with my unit, which was great because that was a constant battle to keep my staff, to keep the funding coming, and to keep operating the way I knew we had to operate. It sounds very full-time, like a full, very full-time job, right? Doing this media uh, campaign and stuff. Whilst you're doing that, are you studying Scientology as well? Are you progressing up the bridge? Yeah, I did. I got up to, my highest level was OT4. When I first got in, in 67, I did the level zero auditor course and became a level zero auditor did a little bit of auditing for the for the la org and then later i did the org exec course flag executive briefing course dsec all of those uh, administrative um, things so i became fairly well trained would you say as a as a Sea Org member, your experience is quite atypical to other ones, other Sea Org members, you know, quite a big cheese, you're doing the media stuff, you're actually progressing up the bridge, you know, what would you say about that? If that was typical? Probably not typical, because most Sea Org members are just kind of head down doing whatever they're assigned to do. I wasn't. I was starting an entirely new activity, which required a lot of research and a lot of finding stuff out, finding out how to do things. I was really a sort of an entrepreneur within the Sea Org. Would you say your role in this core, like media marketing team, one of the main reasons that Scientology did grow so much uh, in the 80s? Yeah, because, you know, people were, or executives, particularly Miss Cabbage, were all, always saying, well, where are the people? You're selling all these books. Where are the people? But from the orgs, I was hearing the opposite. Uh, they were saying, we've got more people than we can handle, and they're all coming in off of the Dianetics campaign. The orgs knew they were getting people, but somehow management didn't know that. You know, I did up the totals later, but there was a huge boom in Scientology in the late 80s. And I can't tell you how many times people would come to me, particularly in the early 2000s, and they would say, well, we just did an evaluation. Stats had started crashing in mid-1991, coincident with my unit being demolished and the campaign stopped. And so then they would do an eval and they'd say, we found out that the, the thing that was really pushing the stats was the Dianetics campaign. So we need you to, to do that Dianetics campaign again. And I said, okay, do I get any staff? No, no, no. Do I get any money? No, 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 no. Just you by yourself at a desk somewhere has to do this whole thing with no staff and no money and no resources of any kind. And I would always refuse to do that. So you're crazy. I can't do it like that. I mean, here's what I need. I need 10 or 12 staff, this, I need a budget, blah, blah, blah. But nobody was willing to commit to that. It was just Jeff, make it go right. 
yeah, you did it once. You can do it again. Just do it. <laughs> it was laughable. Yeah, it sounds like quite a 180 from the time you spent in there when Hubbard was around to the experience you, you had with, with David Miscavige. Was there a flip in your day-to-day -day life after Hubbard died and your experience with David? Well, I just got mushed into the whole marketing unit at that point. So I didn't have a Dianetics campaign unit. We had, it was called the uh, Planetary Dissemination Org, PDO. PDO started absorbing all of the advertising and marketing for every organization in Scientology. We were doing work for WISE and for ABLE and for everything. So we were constantly overwhelmed. That was when the, the events started. It was like five or six events every year. And there was always there always had to be a release at the event to make money, like a tape series or a new book or something. And so it was always a scramble to get everything ready for the next event. And that just became our, our lives. So Dianetics just, uh, it was not a priority at that point, except when the evaluators came around and, <laughs> and said, well, your campaign kicked off the largest boom uh, in Scientology, so do it again. <laughs> Uh, how how long have you been out of Scientology now, Jeff? Um, about seventeen years now. Seventeen years. Wow. Does it feel like a a life ago? You talk about it so vividly and in so much detail. Was there a a particular moment or or something that made you go, I, I gotta go. I gotta get out of here. I want to leave. You know, could could you recall what that was? Well, I had become a sort of punching bag for Miss Gavage. And uh, there was one particular time when he beat me up in a meeting. And that kind of started me thinking. Um, and interestingly enough, there was, you know, I was constantly having to do lower conditions, you know, for one reason or another, you know. And I was doing a, a doubt formula. And when you write it, doubt formula in the Sea Org. It's supposed to start with, my friends are LRH, David Miscavige, Shelley Miscavige, blah, blah, blah. You had to start it that way. Wow. And how, how did you know you had to start it like that? Is it is it part of a policy? Like what? It was just like a custom. And if you didn't start with that, then everybody was like, what? You didn't put LRH or DM there, you know? And it would be like a reasonable thing to think that you could put someone who had been physically abusing you as on that list as your friend. That was kind of my realization. I was writing down my friend, friends are David Miscavige, and then I thought, he's not a friend. Yeah, you're damn right. <laughs> in, in what universe is he a friend of mine? He isn't the friend. And that sort of started the whole thing of, of leaving and eventually I just, I had to get out of there. I, I, I just knew that I had to leave or I was going to die. You know? it, it just got to a, a point of utter desperation and I had to get out of that place. You know, it is the, the most toxic place I have ever been in, is that int base. It was just a horrible, horrible place. And everybody was mean to everybody. And, you know, it was all shame and blame and, you know, on and on and on. And I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to leave this place, you know? And uh, so I just said, I'm le I, I, I want to leave. I want to get out of here. And there's a whole routing form you have to go through. So you didn't blow, you didn't escape or anything. You actually went through the process. I, I should have, but I, yeah, but I, I didn't. I went out officially and it took me about four months, you know, daily sex checking and so forth. And it was, and I was audited so much on, do you have any critical thoughts about David Miscavige, you know? And of course I had plenty. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah, it sounds like doing that doubt formula caused some real cognitive dissonance for you, like having to lie in black and white on paper. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. It sounds awful. Anytime I hear someone talk about the int base, I'm just like, it sounds surreal. Like you said quite flippantly earlier, you know, he uh, hurt me in a meeting and I'm thinking you're a you've got a well-respected job doing this media campaign nobody nobody outside of Scientology in any job could so flippantly say yeah my boss beat me up in a staff meeting <laughs> I know if that happened in any other business that guy would be reported to <laughs> HR and he'd be fired the next day you know if not arrested for assault. Yeah, he'd, he'd be in jail. And I always wondered why nobody ever did ring the police inside the international base. If it was you back then, let's say before you were going to leave, if the police had come round and said, has anything been going on here? Do you, Would you have told them what was happening? No, of course not. No, I would have said, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's wonderful. I mean, that's the problem with um, with that whole thing of the police trying to intervene because people who are professionals in handling human trafficking victims, they know that you have to get the person out of that environment to talk to them. You can't have somebody standing over them and they can't be enmeshed in that environment when you talk to them. You have to pull them out, put them in a room and then say, okay, what's really going on? People who, are, who do that for a living, who interview human trafficking victims, know this, but the police won't do that. If they were going to, going to go in and talk with them, there would always be a person, if not a lawyer, present, and they would be just scared to say anything. Do you think it is still like that today? Oh, yeah. I have talked to people who have left you know, I say, how are things at the base? And they say, oh, they've gotten much worse. And I'm like, I can't even imagine what that would be because it was so toxic when I was there. And people who have left recently say, oh, no, it got much worse. I can't even imagine what, what that would look like. Although I did hear that he stopped beating people up. Well, somebody get him a medal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get, yeah, get him a prize for that. Well, I heard that after I went on uh, Anderson Cooper 360, he stopped beating people up. And I, I, I'll, I'll take that as a win, you know? Yes, because you spoke out, didn't you? You spoke out on, was it called a history, a history of violence? Yeah, the, uh, the Anderson Cooper 360 series. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I went to New York and, and talked about it. When I talk about being beat up by Miscavige, they, uh, they always say, well, why didn't you hit back? Which is kind of silly if you know the situation. Yeah, it's like being in the army, right? Like you've got this hierarchy, this ranking system. So surely the people above you, you can't. I, I was talking to one guy who had been a Navy SEAL and I told him about Miscavige, um, you know, beating me up. And he said, oh, I would have flattened that guy, you know, oh boy, you know, big Navy SEAL guy. And I said, suppose it was an admiral. And he was quiet for a minute. Then he said, oh, I see what you mean. I see. You can't hit him back. When you did that interview, was it the first time you had spoken about this abuse publicly? I had spoken out to the um, Tampa Bay Times. They did a whole series. I was one of the people interviewed for that. Then I was called by Anderson Cooper's people. They flew me out to New York and and I did the show there. I was there with Marty Rathbun. We both did that show. Did it feel good? Did it like, was there a, a sort of level of, I've got my own back for this, for all of this abuse I've received, like take <laughs> that? Yeah, yeah. I said, this is what me hitting back looks like. Did you experience anything after doing that? Did they try come fair game you or did they leave you alone? I have done a lot of a lot of interviews, you know, locally and nationally, and you know, sort of everything. And I've written three three books: my memoir, Counterfeit yeah. Dreams, and then I had a blog for a long time, for a couple of years, called Leaving Scientology. And so I took the best of those blog articles and turned it into a book called Leaving Scientology. And then I did a third book. Uh, I did a series of essays for Tony Ortega about the ethics book. 
because I had always kept a copy of the ethics book because I knew it was important. And I realized after a while that the ethics system is the core of Scientology's mind control system. That's how they keep people in line is with that ethics technology. And so I did, I did a chapter by chapter sort of debunking of the whole ethics system and what was wrong with it. Then I published that as a, as a third book. The last two books are only Kindle. I, don't, and I, I didn't do a, a hard copy version because you know, it, it costs a lot to print a hardback book. It's better for the environment anyway, Jeff. <laughs> when I published uh, Counterfeit Dreams, I actually borrowed about $10,000 to, to print the book, just to do the printing. I made it all back and was able to repay the, the debt pretty quickly. And so, you know, it's all gravy now. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't damage your entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> exactly. But it's nice having a book out there. They're all on Amazon. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I will leave a link in the description. So if anybody would like to go and uh, read those, buy them, do it. Um, you said you wrote a book called Leaving Scientology. And that's kind of some of what I wanted to talk to you about today is what it means to recover from Scientology. Like what are the elements of, of the recovery? That is a really good question. There's a book. Uh, that it was recommended to me by my therapist called Trauma and Recovery. It's by Judith Herman. She is one of the pioneers in what's called complex PTSD or CPTSD, which comes about through long-term abuse, like people who've been in prison, people who've been in concentration camps, and people who've been in cults. That's all long-term abuse. So she was one of the pioneers in complex PTSD. And she has, um, she lays in, out in this book the, the history of PTSD and the remedies over the years, over a long period of time. And she ties it into political movements and all kinds of other things. But um, she gives th three main steps, which I think is very um, useful. One is, you have to get to a safe place. You know, when you leave the cult, you have to get somewhere where you feel safe and where you're not going to be bothered by the cult or bothered by anyone connected to the cult. And I went to Santa Barbara, California, which is a very, very laid back California community right on the coast. That was perfect for me, you know. And um, then step number two is to tell your story which can be done, you know, to another person or to a therapist or like I did, write a book, you know. And I also reconnected with my daughter. Uh, she had been in Scientology when she was a very young child. She was in the, in the nursery in Copenhagen. And then she, when she went to um, Clearwater, she was in the cadet org. Her mother left Scientology and, and, took Gwenny with her. So I lost touch with her for a couple of years. And I didn't know where she was. And then I, I found her, I used an online detective service and found her, uh, found her grandmother. And I called and I said, do you know where, where Gwen is? And she said, yeah, she lives right down the street. So I said, do you have her phone number? So she gave me the phone number and I called my daughter and I said, I'm out of Scientology. I'm living in Santa Barbara. And she said, I'm coming down. I'm getting in my car now and I'm coming down. <laughs> that must have been so amazing. I bet you were, were you, were you nervous to call her for the first time after so long? Yeah, yeah. And, and that was her immediate reaction. She was like, I'm coming down. I'm getting in my car and I'm coming down. And you know, Six hours later, or whatever it was, she arrived at my door. And we spent the whole weekend just talking. And she was the first person that I really unloaded to. I told her about what I'd been through, the things that had happened on the base. And and, and she would go, that's crazy. You know, I was like, no, that was life. But I was free to say, yeah, that was crazy, you know. 
Yeah. And no one's going to raise you for doubt, doubtful or evil intentions or anything like that. If you spoke to somebody else in the Sea Org, if you were having a, you know, if you were like, this is crazy, what's going on? Could you speak to someone or would they just write you up immediately? They would immediately report you. My wife didn't even know the stuff that was going on. She didn't know that, that um, Miscavige was hitting me or beating me up every time he saw me. Why didn't you tell her? Well, because she would have written a knowledge report on me for being disaffected and nattery, you know? That's crazy to me because she's, you know, she's your wife. That's, a, you know, an issue at your job. And the fact that you, if you said that to her, instead of being concerned, she would feel like she had to write you up. And that, you know, it just, it blows my mind, honestly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's like uh, East Germany with the Stasi. Every citizen had to report on every other citizen. You know, living in that environment is just impossible because you're being reported all the time for everything. I'm so glad to hear this um, like reconnection with your with your daughter. That sounds like the the beginning of your recovery journey. You know, was there did you seek out any other kind of support or anything whilst you were rebuilding your life again? I was contacted by a guy I had known in the Sea Org, Chuck Beatty, and he had a, a group on the internet called XSO, where people who had been in the Sea Org were um, chatting. I don't know if you ever experienced that in the very early days of chat. It was just a long string of posts. So I started posting on there using my own name. And all of a sudden, you know, I was just contacted by all kinds of people who I had known in the Sea Org, you know, some very good friends of mine. It was just amazing because I thought I don't know anybody outside the base, you know. It turns out I knew a ton of people, you know, and I got in touch with uh, Janice Grady, who I had known very well in the Sea Org, and, uh, and she was holding these big reunion events down in Las Vegas. And so I went out to that and met up with a bunch of people, some from the ship, the Apollo in the early days, and some from Europe and some from uh, Clearwater when I went there and some from the Int base, Int base. So I got in touch with all kinds of people and oh, that was so great. That was probably the most therapeutic thing was just to talk to everybody about our mutual experience, you know. Yeah, and being being able to connect with people and, and really... To connect and to talk to people yeah. who were there and who know what you were talking about. Because one of the problems with therapy uh, for scient ex-scientologists and, and Sea Org members is that the therapist doesn't know any of this. And so you spend quite a bit of time explaining what that environment was like which isn't necessarily helpful to you to be explaining all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're not really in therapy. You're educating the therapist on how Scientology runs and what this environment was like. I mean, I was fortunate to find a therapist who had been in a cult herself many years before. So she kind of knew the drill, you know, so I didn't have to spend a ton of time explaining to her the way things were in a cult. She had a lot of reality on it herself. So, so that was good. Did um, seeking out a therapist, did you feel any sort of fear? Um, you know, there's this idea that psychiatry are, you know, evil beings sent here to destroy mankind. Did you have any kind of fear about that? I had gotten over that a long time before that, you know. Yeah, I was having some cognitive problems and stuff like that. My daughter, again, bless her heart, said uh, she had a therapist and she said, I want you to go see my therapist. We did it over the internet. We did it over Zoom. Oh, so this is fairly, re this is fairly recent then. Yeah, yeah. It, this was uh, just last year. And, and I had a number of, uh, of sessions with her and my daughter paid for the whole thing. She has just been a gem. She's got two kids. My two grand, I've got a grandson and a granddaughter, and I'm going down to see them on Friday. So that's going to be great. Uh, 
Yeah, that must be so nice now to just have, um, you know, the kind of um, mundane, normal things that, that people do, right? Going to spend time with your family, watching a movie together, having a barbecue, like you can find so much joy in those things um, after leaving something so terrifying, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's great. It's great. And uh, my grandson is going to be 15 this year. And my granddaughter is 22. And she's in college. Can you believe it? I'm officially an old man. Hey, you're as young as you feel, Jeff. Come on, you're as young as you feel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's awesome. I'm, I'm so glad you've got that with your with your family. It's really, um, really nice to, to hear that because nobody deserves that experience at all and and that's why we're all talking about it right it needs to stop and by the sounds of it there's it's still going on potentially even worse today than it was before you mentioned that you have your own support group for for ex-scientologists or even scientologists what what could somebody expect if they came to it yeah yeah, we started that very recently. It's a, an outgrowth of, a, of another group here in Portland called SAFE, Spiritual Abuse Forum for Education. That's run by uh, Reverend Ken Barrett of the uh, Grace Church here in Portland. A wonderful guy. The overall SAFE group is for anyone who is in any cult. So they get uh, ex-Mormons, at Ex Jehovah's Witness, all kinds of people at the bigger group, and I've been to a couple of their meetings. Me and another guy who is an, an ex Scientologist, we decided to to start our own outgrowth from that group that was dedicated to Scientology, recovering from Scientology. We just had our third meeting. It's gotten a bit of interest. We had some new faces last meeting, last weekend, and there were two couples that came to the meeting before that that are still officially in Scientology, but mentally they have left. You know, they don't go to courses anymore or events or anything like that. Like many, many Scientologists, you know, do. There are probably up to 50% of Scientology's existing address list is people who aren't really Scientologists anymore. Mentally, they've left. They haven't announced it. They haven't spoken out. They're just gone. And I think that describes many, many people. If there's uh, somebody watching this who's maybe still in Scientology or is an ex-member, what could they expect when they come to your support group? We have had different topics. It's generally just getting their experiences and everybody talking about what their experience was in leaving and the challenges of leaving and that sort of thing. In fact, last weekend, I brought it up to the group. I asked them what was the most challenging thing about leaving Scientology. A lot of family stuff came up. People who, who now can't talk to their children, can't talk to their parents, you know, it's just tragic. And this is one thing I tell people is that I don't hate Scientologists. They're my friends, and I was one of them. I can't condemn or hate Scientologists. And yeah, I do want to help them. I do want to sort of bring them out of that. In fact, I walked into the Portland Org last month and talked to the two staff that were on reception. I just talked to them. I introduced myself and told them, what my role had been in Scientology, you know, that I had run the campaign that had created the biggest boom in Scientology ever. And I had been commended by Hubbard. The strong intro. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I'm just hitting them with, with my, uh, my bona fides. So they know that I'm not just, I'm not just some crazy critic coming off the street. You know, and I told them the direction you're getting from management is crazy and it won't work. There's two ways to get people into Scientology. One is books and the second is word of mouth. And that's it. Those are the only two things that ever got anyone into Scientology. And then I left them, you know, copies of my book. I had two copies of my book with me and I left them with them. And I said, if you want to find out more about this, just read my book. Your journey and your recovery is going fairly well, but would you, would you say there's anything that is challenging, you know, whether it's meeting new people or with work or jobs or anything that, that may make that difficult? What I had a lot of trouble with when I first got out, I was working for a, a weekly magazine in Santa Barbara. I was laying out their entire magazine and 
and so forth. And I was also the art editor. So I would go interview artists and I would go to gallery openings and that sort of thing. And I found that if I got into a room and I was surrounded by people, that I would have a panic attack and I would just have to get out of there. And it was quite extreme. I had never experienced anything like that before. But if I went to a gallery opening and I was in a room and I was surrounded by people, it was like, I'm out of here. I got to go. Gradually, I got over that and I was able to, to do that. But it was kind of a surprising thing. In Scientology, if I was surrounded by people, it was always bad. They were always going to um, insult me or make me wrong or shame me. I just didn't want people around me. I have always said to people who have left Scientology, stop using the jargon. You know, don't say dev T or any of that stuff. Because I had some friends, two friends who were married, and I went up to their house and they were constantly talking in, in Scientologies. And I said, no, yeah. don't do that. Stop doing that. Because I had to, by necessity, stop using Scientology terms because I was working in an office. I didn't know any, any other ex-Scientologists. You know, I was just among people who had no idea. And I had to really discipline myself to not use Scientology terminology. And in order to do that, I yeah. had to think up what is the English equivalent. Yeah, like translate it in your head. Translate it in my head. And to do that, I had to think about what it was I was trying to describe and then see if I could translate that into English. So in that process, I was re-examining all of these ideas. And I'd say, well, what am I trying to express here? Well, I'm trying to express blah, blah, blah. But that's crazy. I describe it as... You know, my mental gears were frozen, stuck, and rusted. By doing that exercise of trying to rethink all of those concepts, the wheels started to turn. Rust started to flake off. My mental gears were starting to turn. Oh, my God. And then there was just no stopping it after that. What is it? Uh, Sam Janice's channel, isn't it? Peeling the onion comes off in layers, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. It absolutely does. There's a very interesting way to go about talking to a, an ex-Scientologist or even talking to a Scientologist. There's an essay by Hubbard where he talks about how to study Scientology. He, he says, you know, if you're, if you're reading a book or something like that, find something that you agree with in, in the okay. book and then find another thing that you agree with and find another thing that you agree with. That's a, hip, a hypnotic technique uh, that's used by salespeople. They try to get you nodding like this. Yes, yes, I agree, right up to the close. And I, I think Hubbard knew that. So I discovered a very interesting way to go about this, which is you ask a Scientologist, tell me, is there anything in Scientology or in Scientology management or anything like that that you disagree with. Uh, like undo it, just can't, like reverse it, yeah. Yeah, and say, is there anything in Scientology that is not real to you, that you disagree with, or anything management is doing that you disagree with, you know, that's a rich, a rich vein. They start talking about, well, yeah, there was this thing that I disagreed with, and, you know, I was clear, and then they made me go back to the beginning of the grade chart, and I didn't like that, and, and I don't agree with the, them always pushing me for money, and, you know, and pretty soon, it starts to unravel like an old sweater, pull and pull and pull, and the whole thing comes apart. Until that unraveling, that doubt happens, what is it? What, what is it that's keeping that old sweater together? Uh, yeah, it, well, yeah, it's a lot of things that keep it together. There's uh, what, I call, what I call the spell. You're in Scientology, you're under the spell. You know, I don't have many nightmares about being back in, but occasionally I have them. And what is most terrifying about those nightmares is being back under the spell, being in that world and and you know caught up in that mind thing you know yeah it's his own own prison really isn't it a uh, prison a uh, prison of belief right yeah and that's what it is it's you're you're trapped by your own thoughts i mean hubbard was brilliant in that way and that he probably has developed the most effective 
mind control system that has ever existed. I had a, a reporter ask me one time, he said, do you think Hubbard was a con man or a genius? And I said, yes. You can be both. <laughs> He's both. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot to unpack when it comes to undoing the work of Scientology, isn't it? Whether you've been in, in international uh, management, like you said, and you had to experience this physical in real life abuse or actually the uh, abuse from the teachings and what you learn the conditioning that if something is going wrong in your life then there must be something you're doing wrong you know that the paranoia that builds up you know I, I wonder how that fades over time because I, I will say I will think sometimes if, if something's happened I'll first look for the reason why I made that happen even though I know that's not the case you know like a like a instinct Thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's hard to get over that. Uh, such a mind control system. And it's it goes deep. I mean, it's significant that a lot of other cult leaders studied Scientology, uh, like Keith Raniere. Um, he studied Scientology. Werner Erhardt, who did Est, he studied Scientology. In fact, he, he hired a couple of Scientologists to put together his, his system. Yeah, I think it's very important to do a lot of reading about cults. I got very curious once I had decided that I was no longer a Scientologist, which was a big decision. I started reading and I read um, Steve Hassan's book, uh, Combating Cult Mind Control. And he describes his experience with the Moonies. So I was reading his account and I was going, Oh yeah, we had that too. Yeah, oh yeah, we had that too. The thing he was describing was just point for point what I had experienced in Scientology. About halfway through that book, I was going, hey, wait a minute, I was in a cult. And this was like a big realization that I had. Wait a minute, I was in a cult. And then it was like, well, how did I get into a cult? So I started doing a lot of a lot of reading. Steve Hassan's books, and then I read um, Messiah or Madman, the book about Hubbard. Robert J. Lifton wrote a wonderful book about brainwashing and how how it happens. He he did a whole study of American soldiers who had been over in, in Korea and had been prisoners of war. They had created videos of these American soldiers saying how bad America was and how great China was. And everybody was like, how did they get them to do that? And so he did a whole study of so-called brainwashing. And it's just brilliant. He gives 12 points of brainwashing and every single one of them, I was like, yeah, we had that. Yeah, we had that. Just went right down the list. I reread 1984, George Orwell. There is so much in there about cult mentality and how, how people are controlled. And there's a lot of things in there that I was like, oh yeah, we did that. Yeah, yeah, we had that. It's great to, to read a lot. Yes, read lots. Or Audible. I'm an Audible girl myself, I'll be honest. I love I love me an audio book. Um, yeah. <laughs> can we expect <laughs> to see you popping up on the internet anytime soon, Mr. Jeff Hawkins? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I am always doing interviews. I did an interview with Claire Headley recently, and I've been on... Uh, Chris Shelton's channel. I've been on uh, Aaron's channel. Um, so, you know, I am always available to do interviews, um, you know, and whether or not I'll have a channel, maybe. Stay tuned, people. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, in fact, there was a guy that came to our meeting and I introduced myself and he said, yeah, I know you from the internet. <laughs> so you're already youtube famous no channel needed <laughs> so it's like you know it's like i'm from the internet now yeah yeah well it's just such an accessible it's an accessible place for everyone you know so um, i'm not surprised you've been recognized jeff at all <laughs> thank you so so much for coming in chatting to me today your insight on this is absolutely fascinating and i really really appreciate it thank you so much for having me it's always uh i'm always willing to talk about scientology i mean i have a lot of things to say about it and a lot of stories to tell so 
Yes, well, I'm sure we'll be hearing many, many more stories from you. And um, if you guys want to see Jeff again on the channel, please leave it in the comments below. And I'm sure we could uh, ask him to come back and talk to us again. <laughs> <laughs> I would be happy to come back anytime. Thank you very much. I will leave links to your books and things down below. Thank you all for watching. And I'm going to see you guys in the next one. Bye. Great. Bye. Don't you second kiss me, no, no, if you can't see, I've been doing fine by myself, spending all that time by myself, if you never believe, no, no, what you can't see, you'll never make it alright, take a leap or I